Hi, I'm Susie Larson. Thank you for listening to Susie Larson Live. Faith Radio podcasts are only possible because of your support. So thanks for giving and thanks for sharing with a friend. It's only just a matter of Welcome, welcome to Susie Larson Live. Always so honored to get to spend this time with you. In fact, I look forward to bringing you conversations every single day that hopefully inspire you in your faith walk, that deepen your understanding of God's word, and that heightens your awareness of his very real presence in your life. So I got a question for you. When was the last time you saw God do something that took your breath away? Or maybe you heard a story that made you pause and stop in your tracks When was the last time you recounted a miracle in a way that inspired and encouraged others? Well, my friend Carolyn Haas joins me each month for what we now call Miracle Stories with Carolyn Haas, then and now. Each time she joins us on the show, we're going to each pick a passage from Scripture, a story from Scripture that speaks of God's miracle working power. And I literally just found out this morning what her passages and themes were, and I'm amazed at how... God is giving me such a similar theme. So it's so fun to see how she's off in her corner spending time with God. I'm off in my corner. And then we come together and God is breathing uh, just a, a beautiful message that harmonizes. No surprise, but I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Our goal always and our prayer always is that these conversations ignite activated, new, fresh faith. And we actually are bold enough to pray behind the scenes that when some of you listen, some of you will be healed. Uh, Prodigals will come home. Uh, Those of you who have maybe been sleeping for a while in your faith, you suddenly are awakened to a fresh fire. We're going to get Carolyn on in just a moment. Quick announcement. If you're brand new to the Faith Radio family, first of all, welcome. So glad to have you. Second of all, we'd like to get you a welcome pack, and you can do that by just texting the word welcome to 877-933- 2484. And if you want to tell me where you're listening from, go ahead and text me. Just tell me because it's just fun to see. 877-933-2484. Now let me tell you about my guest. We'll get her on the show. Carolyn Haas is co-lead pastor of Substance Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She's passionate about church leadership, parenting, and marriage. She travels the world encouraging and equipping church planters and pastors through the Association of Related Churches. She loves being a mom to her three kids. And in her spare time, you find her with her family probably sipping coffee uh, at a new breakfast spot in the Twin Cities or shopping for deals online. Carolyn, I love you. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Always an honor to be with you, Susie. I've just, it's like firepower. You know, we all, when you have the spirit of God in you, you have a flame in you. And it's like when you put your flame with someone else's and you can burn brighter, there's just nothing like it. And I feel like your fire always burns brightly. So it's so fun when we can come together. So I love it. And I just love that we're doing a podcast on miracles because we've just talked about how we're going to see people come alive. Their faith is going to be strengthened as we talk about what God's doing. Yeah. And the theme that I think kind of carries through these shows, I think you'll notice if you go back to listen to some of our past shows, is cultivating heart of an expectancy. We've got to keep a posture of expectancy. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Before <laughs> we dig in, just in your in your time with the Lord, what's he been talking to you about. So just this week, I was reading 1 Corinthians 13 and um, verse 12 really spoke, stuck out to me. And I, I just love this. It says this, now we see things imperfectly as in a cloudy mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely just as God now knows me completely. And I just, there's two statements that I just haven't seen in a while. And it was like, all I know now is partial and incomplete. Mm, All I know. All like, yeah. And I thought that's a humbling statement. Mm -hmm. I think we all have areas that we feel like our knowledge is pretty complete. Like we really know, you know, and I thought, and cloudy mirror, I mean, for a guy to shave, for a girl to do her hair makeup, like, uh, you can't see, do you know what I mean? So I just thought, is there something that we think today that we know fully And that maybe because we think we know it fully, it's impacting our emotions, it's impacting Mm. our faith, but realizing what you know is incomplete. But then I love that God doesn't leave it there. He actually, Paul says, but God now knows me completely. And I just thought, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, how does that truth change my current reality right now? What steadiness does this bring knowing that God now knows me Mm. completely? 
Amazing, like, amazing. I don't. I know I've shared this on the show before, but I don't think I've shared it with you. But um, as someone who's battled insomnia off and on my whole adult life, it's always been a, a thorn and a hard thing. When I have a dream and a vivid dream, I mean, I have some dreams that are like, that was chips and salsa, I'm pretty <laughs> sure. But there's other times I wake up and go, that was from the Lord. Yeah. And nobody can tell me otherwise, because I'll wake up with faith in my heart or clarity or something where I've gone to bed discouraged or whatever. And in this dream, I met this camp type, it was a camp slash resort. And I didn't work there, but I knew my way around there. And uh, so the staff knew me and it was just, a, you know, beautiful place. And this whole new group came in and they were sitting at this long log table. And I, since there was no server around, I got them all uh, menus and said, I'll get your drink orders and uh, they'll be with you in a minute. So I took all the drink orders. And this is the part you'll appreciate about me, Carolyn, because you know me as a former you know, gymnast. And you know, I will be a dancer in heaven just because I love <laughs> to move. And I, I like literally took their drink orders and I'm like, I'll be back in a minute. And I pushed off the table and did this pirouette flip. And then I land, you know, and then I push off another table and kick way over my head and do a back flip. And I'm just dancing through the tables with perfect fitness and really good form. And, uh, and I'm just enjoying, just enjoying serving and loving. And all of a sudden, after I've several pirouettes that were exceptional, <laughs> um, I, I stop and I look in the distance and, and this was this gorgeous resort room, you know, but there was an older room like it, they had built on so the, all the rest of that that we were in was new and beautiful, but there was like this little little area that must have been part of the original building, and it was musty and old. And there was an old mirror that had these kind of ripples in it, and it was a dim mirror. Wow. And when I'd pushed off and kicked up, um, in the mirror I glanced over, and it was like this terrible, I looked terrible. I looked wow. 20 pounds heavier. My, my leg was all, you know, not formed. And yet... And I, I, like, my heart just sunk, and I'm like, what? And then all of a sudden, I remembered, no, I was there. My toe was pointed. Yes. <laughs> my kick was really great. And, but it was like this distorted, outdated opinion. And I, I shared it with a friend who's an intercessor, and she said, Susie, that mirror represents our outdated opinions of ourselves. And wow. she said, you are operating in the fullness of who you are in the kingdom. And then you got a, glim- a glimpse at the old man. And that's what the enemy wants to do is keep getting you to look at the old man. So, Because you, you'll never be able to fulfill the purposes of God yeah. if you keep just looking at a gl- glass dimly. you got to wow. see yourself through the eyes of Christ. And I thought, wow, that's, that's good. I mean, we need fresh revelation to be able to see ourselves as yes. a kingdom of priests, yes. don't you think? Yes. Yeah. That is so incredible. I just yeah. love it. It's yeah. the transformed body that God gives us in heaven, I think, too. But I just love that. Man, God knows you right now. Susie, That's right. Completely amazing. He knows what you need. Mm-hmm. He knows what you. He knows what you need. Mm-hmm. Amen. And in heaven, when I am flipping off the tables, <laughs> I'll expect a, just a little round of applause. Or I will be there cheering, <laughs> cheering you <me> on. on. <laughs> I have no that desire to be dance, so, fun. so I will just be <laughs> in the golf club. <laughs> That's right. I will be dancing. All righty. So tell me about the story from scripture that you want to dig into today. Uh, today, I want to dig into Luke chapter five. We're going to read uh, verses 12 and 13. Um, I just love it. So let's just jump right in. It says, in one of the villages, Jesus met a man with an advanced case of leprosy. Okay. Before we go any further, I just thought, ooh, advanced case. I thought, as you're listening today, who has an advanced case of discouragement, of mm. depression, of anxiety, of prodigal son, daughter, just what you're perceiving is an advanced case. It's not just an allergy or a cold. Do you know what I mean? So there's an advanced case of leprosy. When the man saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground, begging to be healed. Lord, he said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out, touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. Now, I remember reading this 25, 30 years ago. And I remember at the time, my husband, Peter, was asking me for prayer for allergies, something that's so common. I don't, now I'm happen to be blessed. I actually don't have any allergies and it's mm-hmm. just wonderful. Um, but allergies are so common. And I remember when he asked me to pray, I just remember thinking, it's allergies. It's not cancer. Like, does God care about allergies? And I read this passage and it changed how I prayed because I realized God cares. He's willing. And I think Jesus didn't just heal him. He communicated his heart and his intention. I am willing. Now let me actually do the Mm -hmm. miracle and be healed. And so I just thought, I wrote in my notes, like our theology of knowing that God heals, but that he actually cares and that he's willing, it's going to impact how we pray. It's going to impact how we ask of him. So we have to be convinced that he actually wants this and is willing. 
So good. So Psalm 145, I've been living in that uh, chapter off and on for the last year. Listen to this. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. Listen to this. He's good to everyone. He's good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. All of your works will thank you, Lord, which means all of us need to be thanking him. All your faithful followers will praise you. I mean, are we in a posture of praise? Now listen to this. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. I love it. And, you know, scripture says the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And how often are we content with a powerless Christianity? Yes. We not only have examples of power in scripture. Yes. If we really are willing to look at our history, there are examples of God's power that maybe we've walked right by and not taken notice of, but they're there. But as you start to prioritize that and normalize that, saying this is normal Christianity to walk in power. Lord, I need some new experiences with your power because I need to give examples of your power. That's a call from God. It says yeah. we will tell about your mighty deeds, about the majesty of and glory of your reign for your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and you rule throughout all generations. I just want that to be kind of a backdrop for all of these conversations you and I have that we can give examples of your power, you know, that we're not going to run out of miracle stories because he's the same yesterday, today and forever. So, so pick it up where you love. That's exactly it. I just, well, and what I love about that is that it's okay to acknowledge that we aren't sure. Do you know what I mean? I remember that story, Mark nine twenty four, where the guy was like, I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. Do you know what I mean? And I yeah. think just to acknowledge, I do know God. I've, I've read the scripture. I'm hearing these stories, but I still have some unbelief. Help convince me. You know, and again, that's why we read the Bible. That's why we're sharing these stories. I love uh, Mark sixteen twenty says, the disciples went out and preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it, that miracles are supposed to be a part of Christianity. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. you, you mentioned uh, power and preaching. First Corinthians 2 says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. There's something about our faith that actually happens when the power of God is revealed. Mm -hmm. And I think we live in such a discouraging world. We have different inputs that we're listening to. And so we often just think, eh, he hasn't done it. Therefore, he's not going to. He's not willing. And then, then we don't have that expectation and we don't ask. Wow. So good. We've got about two minutes before the break. Is there anything else you want to add before? On the other side of the break, we'll set up your modern day miracle. But when you think about the idea of what you're seeing in scripture, we're trying to normalize that power needs to be a part of our our kingdom experience. And yet we don't dictate to God. He dictates to us. We align ourselves with him and he's the one who decides when, how, where. But I think to keep a posture of any day now, I'm living with a holy expectancy. I I get nervous when I see people trying to dictate to God to tell him what to do because he's mighty and he's holy and we're to revere him and honor him. He calls the shots. But I think when you think daily, the heavens pour forth speech Yes, and that he is the same yesterday, today and forever. And that salvation means so much more than checking a box and escaping help. So much more. I think the more that we understand all that Jesus won for us, we can't help but be in a posture of expectancy. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. So he does need to have the permission to write the script and interrupt our plans. And I think if we're not aware that he's ever present with us... Mm -hmm. I think we think of him as distant. We think mm-hmm. of him as not seen. He's busy. He's looking. He's distracted. And so I think part of it is realizing, no, he's in the boat. He's yeah. actually in the storm. Yep. He's ever present. He's there when we're hungry and, and the multitudes need to be fed. Do you know what I mean? And so it is that turning and being aware of his presence in our lives and going, God, what's the creative miracle that you want to do? Even though I've never seen you multiply food and I've never seen you speak to a storm. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. you're with me. Open my eyes to be aware of what your presence tangibly, actively, powerfully is like in my life. And I think if we can think about that, when, like, maybe you can finish this statement when you're thinking about your story, but I thought, but I thought that. And when that's when you get into disappointment, and it's okay, you need to identify this is what I had expected for my life, or my son, or our marriage, or our mirror. This is what I was looking for. And when you're in the in-between before the miracles happen and you can say, but I thought that you think your ways are higher than his and your thoughts are higher than his. But every time you see that in scripture, I mean, think about the disciples. They thought he was going to overthrow Rome. Right. You know, and right. that would be the ultimate because they were oppressed by right. the Romans. Right. And uh, that seemed like a lofty goal, but that is not at all why he came. He came to overthrow the devil. Right. And the devil's claim on humanity, so much higher. So I think we have to really grasp that when we want to finish that statement, I thought that 
His ways are higher. Yes. His thoughts are deeper. And his love runs wider. And if we can trust that, we can back up a little bit and go, okay, I thought this, but you must have something bigger. And so, yes. <laughs> he yeah. wants to surprise us. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. When we come back, we're going to hear from Carolyn about uh, a story or two, a miracle story or two. And then uh, eventually I'm going to bring a passage to that I've just been hanging around a little bit, just my miracle story from scripture and a miracle story from modern day life. Carolyn Haas is my guest today. Every month she joins me for miracle stories then and now each month we'll draw from stories from scripture and then we'll draw from stories from just modern day living because he's an active and involved God and he loves you. We'll be back in a minute. Faith Radio podcasts are produced by the listener supported ministry of Faith Radio. If you're interested in becoming a team member, a donor to this ministry, you can support the podcast anytime and donate at myfaithradio.com. Hope you're having a really great day. Thanks for tuning in to Susie Larson Live. My very precious friend, Carolyn Haas, joins me today. In fact, joins me every month for what we're calling Miracle Stories with Carolyn Haas, then and now. We come together each month. What's so fun is we both love God's Word. We love His presence. And separately, we just sort of do our own digging, and then we kind of come together and see what we came up with. Both of us will dig into Scripture to find a miracle story that we want to highlight on each show, and then just some stories from our own lives of God's involvement, God's God's intervention. And when you think of a miracle, you, they're, you know, they're, they're large and small. I mean, truly divine intervention in a way that can be explained no other way. But then again, how do you explain a butterfly or a baby being born, you know, or the sun rises and the sun sets or a heart that was hardened suddenly soften and turn towards Jesus? I mean, miracles are everywhere. And what we're hoping to accomplish in these shows is to help maybe turn over the hardened soil of your heart if you've gotten disappointed and offended with God, to stay expectant and to be looking um, to him because he's the author and the perfecter of your faith. And he's still writing a great story. So, Carolyn, what story do you want to share with us today? So my husband, Peter, actually wrote this story and kind of documented it in his book, Mm -hmm. Um, But it was actually in the early days of us planting Substance Church. And I'll never forget, we're having a leadership meeting in our home in Fridley, Minnesota at the time. And uh, anyway, all of a sudden, one of the leaders just said to my husband, Pastor Peter, like, why don't I see more miracles? Like, I've actually never seen a miracle. And he's like, you're always talking about miracles, but I've never seen one. And my husband was like, well, do you ever trust God for miracles? Like, I know it's kind of obvious, but, you know, uh, the Apostle James said, you have not because you ask, ask not. And, uh, and so he's like, and then the guy was like, you know, you're right. I don't even bother to pray. I, I just have never even asked God for a miracle. And so literally as they're having this conversation, my phone rings and I get a call from a college girl. She actually went to Northwestern University <laughs> and uh, she called and she's weeping on the phone, went to substance and, um, she had just come back from the doctor, diagnosis of a huge tumor. In fact, in the last week, it had doubled in size. Two of her family members had experienced that same cancer diagnosis. Her family were not believers at all. So they're freaking out. She's calling us weeping. Of course, I prayed with her, but got off the phone and um, my leaders were like, what was that? You know, and so like on cue, it was like, you want to see a miracle? Here's our opportunity, but we're going to fast. We're going to pray and we're going to trust God for Elizabeth was her name. And so we did, we fasted, we prayed that whole week. And, uh, and then I'll just for a second, you are willing to go to the mat with her. You know, I think there's times we want to see miracles from a spectator role. I want to sit in the stands and go, why don't I ever see miracles? But you're on the field going, okay, let's roll up our sleeves. Yes. Let's deprive our flesh. Yes. Let's seek God. <laughs> I mean, there's there's engagement and, you know, there's times you have to contend a lot of times, most times you have to contend in a way that costs you. So yes, and, that's and important. think about the gathering of several, when two or three gather in his yeah. name, yeah. he's present. Do you know what I mean? So it wasn't just me and Peter, but it was a team of leaders that are like, we, this is a member of our church. We're going to we're going to yeah. do this together. And so we prayed, we fasted. And at the end of the week, she got, you know, her final x-ray before surgery. Well, the doctor comes in and he actually looks at her really concerned, which that's never no, good, right. yeah. you know, and especially right before surgery. And he said, I don't know how this is medically possible, but I can't find a single trace of the cancer. And then she told the doctor, just kind of smiled and went, well, my church is praying right now. Like they've been praying all week. And so it was one of those fun stories for us to even coach her as a young college student. Hey, 
get those medical files. Like you had the x-rays. There's there's medical proof that you had cancer. Let's now get the after x-ray showing so that you can hold it forever. That's because years, right. Years down the road, you forget. You just, yes. think, ah, no, nah, it didn't happen. And I'm like, we always need to have remembrance that God did a miracle. And what mm-hmm. I love about that is that isn't just Elizabeth's story. That's my story now. That's, mm-hmm. my, you know, like we That's all right. Get it's your to, fruit. So even though I didn't get healed of cancer, I was a part of Elizabeth getting healed. Yeah. And now I can declare the goodness of God. Amen. You know, I did a show the other day on just um, a, a day where leaders are falling and um, how do we stand strong? And I just talked about some of the things that I feel like would be wise for us. But one of them was if, if you're in a season of like prosperity and blessing where you're not, because there's times God gives us rest from battle. Uh, most times we're in a battle, but there's times where he gives you a, a reprieve, right? Yeah. And I do think that if that goes too long, you get soft. It's like David, when kings go out to war, he went onto the deck and that's when he sinned. Yeah. And I feel like there's shouldering one another's burdens. Yes. When you're in a season of, of plenty and of fullness, I think you've got to engage with those who, who aren't. Yes. And you got to shoulder some burden and do some fasting, do some praying and war on their behalf, enter into a suffering that's not your own for their sake and for your sake. I yes. think it keeps you, uh, keeps your combat skills yeah. sharp and, yeah. uh, but keeps your faith engaged and, uh, we're supposed to do this together. So. Well, and to be honest, I was just telling this to someone yesterday. It's easier for me to pray for you and what you're going through and for your family members or for your, than it is even for my own issues, mm-hmm. you know, or for my own family where it's very, emo- I'm emotionally engaged or mm-hmm. connected. Like I don't have any emotion towards your diagnosis. All I have is faith. Mm, so, it, so it's wow. just easy for me to carry your burden because I'm actually not burdened by it. That's so You know so what I mean? And so I, that's oh, the whole goodness. purpose of the church. Yes. <laughs> wow. I don't know if you're supposed to clap on radio, but I couldn't help myself. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you, Lord. Wow. I don't carry the burden, so I have more room for faith. That's it. That's so good. Wow. Well, you were going to say something about just the psychology behind. Yeah. Um, so I think it's always great to like, yay, we love these stories. We love, you know, reading the Bible. We love hearing this. But I think it's important to know there is some scientific research that actually proves that some of us have a greater ability to see the miraculous than others. Hmm. And that's kind of a scandalous statement. Um, and so listen to this psychology experiment. It actually has changed the way I read the Bible. So if you've ever heard of the book, it's called Invisible Gorilla. That's where this research study comes from. But there was this research group of researchers that made... Uh, a group of people watch a video, uh, watch a basketball video. And they said, okay, we want you to watch this basketball video. And we, the goal of the researchers was we want to pay attention to how attentive are the people watching. So they're staring at a video of basketball. What are they observing? What are they seeing? So they asked the people, okay, as you're staring at this video, how many times is the team passing the ball? That seems very simple. Count how many times the ball gets passed. Of course, right in the middle of the basketball video, a huge giant gorilla jumps into the middle of the camera, beats its chest (laughs) for nine seconds. Nine seconds is actually quite long. If you go one, one thousand, two, I mean, I'm not going to, yeah, that's a long time. Okay, then gets off. After the video, the people, the test subjects are asked, how many times did the team with the black shirts pass the ball to the team with the white shirts? Very simple, right? Then they ask a second follow-up question. Did you notice anything strange? Did you see any animals? Did you see a gorilla suit? (laughs) And get this, every time only 50% of the people saw the gorilla. Researchers were astounded. They're like, there's no way. How can 50% of the people miss something so obvious that was there for nine seconds? So they thought, well, maybe people aren't directly looking at it. So they literally even watched and tracked people's eyes. And they found that, no, when people's eyes were staring straight at the gorilla, still 50% didn't see it. So then they're like, then they showed them the gorilla clip. They repeated it, told them there's a gorilla. And people were like, how did I miss that? How did I not see it? Okay, so then it gets, the research gets crazy. They literally said if you're on your cell phone staring at the video, you only 10% of the people saw the video. So, I mean, there, that just is a whole nother research of, oh, a whole nother maybe show. we yes. shouldn't be driving and talking yes, on the phone, right? Exactly. Okay, but anyway. Cell phones hinder <laughs> miracles. <Just> they, <laughs> so, they actually have this, the phenomenon is actually called inattentional blindness. And so, inattentional blindness is an inability to see unexpected and Whoa. obvious things Due to mental preoccupation. Say that again. Okay, so inattentional blindness is an inability to see unexpected and obvious things due to mental preoccupation. One of the examples they used is here in America, we don't have as many motorcyclists as the globe does, all different countries around the globe. So we have way more motorcycle accidents. They said like in Thailand, there's motorcycles everywhere and the accident rate is really low because they expect to see motorcycles everywhere. But because we don't expect to see that in the United States, we have way more accidents. Hmm. So it's kind of... so. Can you imagine this phenomena when it comes to miracles? Like, let me say this. If you don't expect to see a miracle, 
you generally won't. Like people generally only see what they expect to see. So even if a miracle took place right in front of you, there's a large probability that your brain won't even register it. Again, our expectation alters our ability to see this. And there's so many scriptures that can prove this, but I just think, hey, we need to pay attention to, we all want miracles. We're, we're God, why can't I see a miracle? And it's like, well, do you expect? Mm. Are you looking? Are you asking? Are you, again, convinced he is willing? Because if we are, then we're going to start opening our eyes and seeing. Wow, somebody got to gotta text me an amen. How often do we say, God, do a new thing, but we keep doing the same thing. Yes. Really. You know, if we want a new experience with God, somehow we need to just develop a new posture before God. And I just think it's powerful to kind of up your game, to lean in a little bit deeper, maybe get a different translation of scripture, buy a new journal, do something, get a new worship playlist, but approach God, you know, just keep it from becoming something you phone in or something you check off because you stop looking for something new. But when you realize you're meeting with the God of heaven... The one who merely spoke and the heavens came to be. He merely spoke and the heavens came to be. That should never get old. Correct. And that God wants to do something new. I think the reason why the disciples, when feeding of the 5,000, they were like, we don't have any money. We got nothing. Send the people away. They'd never seen Jesus multiply food. So in their brain, it wasn't even an option. Right. Do you know what I mean? And then when they're in the storm, they're freaking out because they'd never seen him speak to the winds and waves. And I just think, what is a miracle that we've never seen? Hmm. Doesn't mean we shouldn't ask God. Doesn't mm-hmm. mean we shouldn't expect him. Like, let's not only look at what he's done and go, well, he's multiplied food. He's provided tax money out of fishes. So I can ask him to do the things I've already seen. But what are the things we've never seen? And what could, if God wants to do that? Come on, somebody. I don't even know what to say. So I'm going to go to break. That's so amazing. Talking to Carolyn Haas. When we come back, we're going to dig into a passage from 2 Kings. And it'll take me a little unpacking, but I think there's something here that we can learn. And I'll share a a miracle story. Maybe you've heard from me before. Maybe not. I'm not sure. But we've got more miracle stories to go. Carolyn Haas is my guest today. She joins me every month for miracle stories. Then and now, digging into scripture, making a biblical case for our miracle work in God. Wow. Isn't that great? We'll be back in a minute. Thanks so much for tuning in to Suzy Larson Live. My friend Carolyn Haas joins me every month for what we're calling Miracle Stories Then and Now. And each month we come together. And, you know, it's so fun to me because she digs in the scriptures on her own with her time with God. I do the same. And we come together and we come up with stories that we want to highlight. And so often they weave together into a beautiful theme. And we also share modern day miracles. So we've got more to go. And I'm I'm just going to confess, I, I've got two significant passages here that are long. And so if you just pray for me as I'm trying to unpack this, because I feel like there's so much in here that I want to highlight because I think it's a word in due season for us. But I'm in Second Kings chapter 6 and 7. And Elisha is, uh, so the king of Aram, he's at war with Israel, and he keeps making all these mobilized plans to attack Israel. But Elisha keeps telling the king of Israel what, what the enemy's about to do, because, because Elisha walks intimately with God, Uh, It keeps him several steps ahead of the enemy. And this king is getting so furious going, who is the mole? Who's the one giving away all our stories? And there's like, it's not us. They said, uh, it's Elisha the prophet. Uh, He tells the king of Israel, even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. There's something so powerful about that. I mean, Jeremiah 33, 3 is call on me and I will answer you and tell you great and mighty things, which you do not know about the times to come. Uh, Deuteronomy 29, 29, I think it is, is the secret things belong to the Lord and the things he reveals to us belong to us and our children forever. Another passage says he confides in those who fear him. So talking about expectancy on the show today, what if you added expectancy to that aspect of God's character, his willingness to keep you several steps ahead of the enemy, his willingness to give you a heads up so that you're not falling into traps all the time. So, of course, the king's so upset going, who is this dude? And that's Susie's translation. I don't think dude is in there. Go find out where he is. And the report came to where Elisha was staying. When the servant of Elisha, the man of God, got up the next morning, went outside, listen to this, troops, horses, and chariots were everywhere. I mean, talk about being surrounded by the enemy. Oh, sir, what will we do now? He cried to Elisha. Elisha says, don't be afraid. 
And Elisha was walking so intimately with God. He didn't need this reassurance, but he did it for his servant. For there are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes. Now listen to this. When he looked up, he also, he, he saw the hillside was filled with horses and chariots. But the difference here was horses and chariots of fire. Come on. <laughs> and the thing is, what's the difference between the best wow. the enemy can do and the best God can do? Firepower. Come I'm on. just saying, you know. <laughs> and uh, so he revealed that and he showed him far more are those who are with us. And they're the ones who've got the superpower, right? And so the army advanced, and you can read the rest of that story. But then I want to jump ahead. After some time, it was, time had passed, the same king went and mustered an entire army and besieged Samaria. And because of that, he ravaged the land, and there was terrible famine in the land. And the king of Israel was walking along the wall, and a woman called and said, you got to help me. And long story short, this woman and another woman had said, she said, today we'll eat my son, tomorrow we'll eat your son. I mean, unbelievable. It's in the scripture, but that's how bad it was. So they ate her son and the other one hit her son. And this king is like tearing his robes going, what on earth? What have we come to? And he was upset even with Elisha bringing news. And Elisha knew that the king was going to blame him for be, you know, shooting the messenger, basically. So this is what Elisha says. Listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. By this time tomorrow, in the markets of Samaria, six quarts of choice flour will cost only a piece of silver. Twelve quarts of barley grain will cost a piece of silver. And the officer assisting the king said to the man of God, (laughs) this couldn't happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. Even though there's other places in scripture that that are conditioned, if you do what God says, he will open the windows of heaven. Wow. But he kind of like tried to, to declare that would never happen. Elisha said, you will see it happen with your own eyes, but you will not be able to eat any of it. Because you have such a faithless statement coming out of your mouth, you're going to see the glory of God, but you're not going to be able to participate in it. Now listen to this. There were four men with leprosy sitting on the entrance of the city gates. Why should we sit here and die? They said, let's go out to that camp, the enemy camp. Either they capture us and, you know, we can get something to eat or they kill us and, oh, well, we're going to die anyway. So they set out for the camp. And when they get to the edge of the camp, no one was there. The Lord had caused the Armenian army to hear the clatter of speeding chariots and galloping horses. So he caused, you know, the superpower sound of the great army approaching. The king and that king said, well, the king of Israel's hired the Hittites and Egyptians to attack us. So they cried to one another. They panicked. They ran into the night, abandoning everything, their tents, horses, donkeys, and everything else. They just fled for their lives. So when the men with leprosy arrived at the edge of the camp, They went one tent after another after another. They ate, they drank, they carried off silver and gold and clothing. And finally, they felt guilty about it and said, you know, (laughs) it's not right. We should go tell others about this. So they went back to the city to the gatekeepers and said, what happened? We went out to the camp. No one was there. Horses and donkeys were tethered, tents all in order. But there wasn't a single person around. The gatekeepers shouted the news to the people of the palace. Now, this is interesting. The king got out of bed in the middle of the night and told his officers, I know what's happened. It goes back to what you were saying, Carolyn, when we think we know. Wow. You know, you know in part. He was so bracing for impact and so identified with his hardship that he was declaring something that was wrong. He was becoming paranoid. I know what happened, he said. The Armenians know that we are starving, so they have left their camp and have hidden the fields. They're expecting us to leave the city, so they'll take us alive and capture the city. The Lord had caused the roaring thunder, the sound of an army, to clear out that camp, to bring provision to his people who were starving. And the king, the leader of the people, saying, this is a trap of the enemy, not the provision of God. I mean, think about that, because he was not walking in step with God. He was fixating on his problems, and so he did not have expectancy that God somehow would come through and provide. So one of his officers said, well, we had better send scouts out. So they sent him out, and they came back and basically verified, yes, this is the deal. The scouts returned and told the king about it. The people of Samaria rushed out. Remember, they're starving. So they plundered the camp. And it was true. Listen to this. I love it whenever it says so. So it was true. The six quarts of choice flour were sold that day for one piece of silver. Twelve quarts of barley grain sold for one piece of silver, just as the Lord had promised. The king appointed his officer to control the traffic at the gate. But he was knocked down and trampled to death as the people rushed out. So here's another so. So everything happened, exactly as the man of God had predicted when the king came to his house. The man of God had said to the king, by this time tomorrow, the markets of Samaria, six quarts of choice of flour will cost one piece of silver, 12 quarts of barley grain, one piece of silver. 
The king's officer had replied, that could not happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. And the man of God said, you will see it happen with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. And so it was. The people trampled him to death at the city gate. And here's what the study note says. When Elisha prophesied God's deliverance, the king's officer said it couldn't happen. The officer's faith and hope were gone. But God's word is true anyway. It comes true anyway. The officer missed out on God's blessing because he lacked trust in God's power. Hear that again. The officer missed out on God's blessing because he lacked trust in God's power. Sometimes we become so problem focused that we have a hard time listening when someone holds out hope or tells us about God's promises. Instead of focusing on the negatives, we should cultivate an attitude of expectancy. I did not know Carolyn was going to come with a message on expectancy. This is what I came with. And we brought our notes together early. I mean, it's just amazing. (laughs) When our resources are low and our doubts are the strongest, God can open the floodgates of heaven. Our faith may be weak. Or small, but we must avoid becoming skeptical of God's provision. If you are doubting God's power or goodness, ask Him to encourage your faith and strengthen your hope. Surrender your fears and release control of your situation to God. Wow. There's so much in there. Oh you know, God. I mean, so much in there where we, we, you get so identified with your trial, you really stop looking for provision and then you become cynical and skeptical when it comes. Uh, I've been referring over and over again lately because it just fits so much, but Jeremiah 16 or 17, verses 6 and 7. But verse 6, it talks about cursed are those who trust in man made solutions. They're like a stunted shrub in the desert and they don't see goodness when it comes. So when your eyes go to the earth and go to man, you will miss it. We've got to be focusing on God or, you know, we cry out for miracles, but where's our gaze and where's our heart engagement, you know? Yes. So, uh, and the miracle I want to share, if I could, uh, and some of you on the show have heard this before. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive I've shared it, but hang with me here. But, you know, okay, during my third pregnancy, many months of bed rest, I was allowed up one day, six months along, and... Uh, Got to meet my old college roommates for a lunch and just, I was depressed because I was in bed with a one and a three-year-old and the doctors were, I had contracted in a couple of days. They said, why don't you get up and go? So I had lunch and we had fun and I was careful, but I was contracting and back in bed. And two weeks from that outing, my face started to go numb and vision started to blur and all the neuro symptoms, you know, crept up. I still had three months to go in this pregnancy. Um, and I couldn't believe that there were overlapping crises. You know, I couldn't believe that I was already using up all my friend flavors. So with all the pregnancy stuff, I was going to have nobody when I was done. And it was confronting all my insecurities because I couldn't be on any committees at church. I couldn't help anybody. I was a debt to society and God seemed silent. It literally felt like he lost my address. I mean, I would read scripture and it felt dead on the page. And I was young enough in my faith. I did not know what God was doing. And I also had a visual of a gal at our church who had MS. And I, this is what the enemy does is when, when God is going, bringing you through a refining time, God did not send line, but he allowed it. You know, the enemy knows because the enemy is the one who positions the overplayed enemy attack. But he will always give you a visual of your worst case fear. Wow. And your battle might be something completely different than that visual but the enemy doesn't care. He's a liar. And so being stuck on bed rest for three months with that visual of a woman my age, kind of athletic like me, spiraling down with all these neurosymptoms, and then I've got all this going on in my body, I can't, I can't even tell you. So I delivered Jordan of three weeks early. Not 10 months prior to that delivery, my middle son Luke was in the hospital at 18 months old with a respiratory virus. And the doctors at one point said, his heart won't make it another 24 hours. His, he had a respiratory virus where his chest was like caving in with every breath. I mean, literally, he was like half conscious and it looked like his ribs broke with every breath he took. It was devastating and so painful. And then, you know, they changed his medicine and he got better. We got him home. So I delivered Jordan in the winter and they said, you almost lost your middle son, your toddler, not 10 months ago. You had a four-week-old, or no, you got a baby and we've got RSV as an epidemic, a respiratory virus, and it's winter. So put out the word that nobody should come visit you um, with any kind of cold because he's susceptible to catching things quickly and you got a baby and it's an airborne virus. We put the word out and a woman came with her sick child with a green runny nose and within a couple of days, Luke was wheezing and his chest started to retract and the doctor said, well, we would admit him, but you've got a baby. This is airborne. We're going to teach you to help you treat him at home and we'll just stay in touch. We had a little split entry house. In the basement, we had a little 
um, playpen, put a blanket over it, and a steamer that blew in. Like we created a tent like you'd have at the hospital. They taught us how to pound on his lungs with our cupped hands to loosen up his lungs. So I would pound on his lungs side by side, disinfect my hands, change my shirt, and go sit in this little rocker till the baby needed to be nursed at this little split entry. Go nurse Jordan, disinfect my hands, change my shirt, go back down to Luke. And I did it all day, all night, every day for weeks. So now if you want to give your body, you know, a disease, a run, a runway, deprive yourself completely of sleep. I had all these neural symptoms going on, but I'm like, I'm stressed. We're going broke. I'm sure that's what this is, but I can't think about that. I got to keep these kids separate because he's sick and we got a new baby. I want to say almost four weeks in, I, I thought I would die from fatigue. I go get Jordan out of his crib. He's four weeks old and he's rattling in his cough. And so... And I still didn't know what God was doing, but we called our life group over and one of them brought a guitar and he worshiped and they prayed. And I felt the presence of God like I hadn't felt in super long. I mean, it was like, I felt like, I don't know why he's not talking to me right now, but he's obviously in their midst. So I'm just going to kind of by osmosis (laughs) scoot up close. And it just felt so good to feel his presence. And they all put his hands on their hands on Jojo. And I thought, we're, we're on the cusp of a miracle. I, I could feel his presence. The next morning, I go to get my little one out of the crib, and his lips are blue. He's coughing so much. So I brought him to the hospital, and they didn't even have me register him. They grabbed him out of my hands and said, follow us. And they ran him to the, an ER room and got him hooked up and admitted him with double pneumonia at four weeks old. And so we're, they're walking us to his room, and it was two do- doors down from where Luke had been 10 months prior, 10, 11 months prior. And I saw Luke's room as we walked by and we got into this little room and Kev went to call family and I sat down in the rocking chair. It's the dead of winter. I hate winter. I just hate winter. I don't feel well during the winter. And this felt like I had many winter seasons in a row and they put him in his little tent. They got him hooked up on his IV. I was exhausted. And all of a sudden I was overcome with joy, overcome with joy and peace. Like I couldn't explain it. It was like it was dumped onto me. And I wrote in my journal, I don't know what this is, Lord, but I'll take it. I need to take a break here. When I come back, I'm going to tell you what God did in that moment. It was a miracle what God did. So I'm going to pause here. Stay with me. We'll be back in a minute. I don't know about you, but I love consistent nourishment. I love to fast on occasion. There's a purpose in that. But if you go too long without eating on a regular basis because you're too busy, your body actually goes into crisis mode. Well, in the same way, your soul, your spirit, they need nourishment too. And that's why it's so important to be listening to scripture, listening to good teaching on a consistent basis throughout the day. That's why we're here. We love what we do and we want to do it with you. If you listen on our on the radio on the terrestrial signal, we encourage you download our free faith radio app. That way, if you're traveling this season, You can take us with you wherever you go. You can catch the live shows or even the podcast after the fact. And we've made it easier than ever. All you have to do is text the word app to 877-933-2484 and then click the link. I hope you will walk with us on this journey. Greater things are yet to be done in and all around us because God, well, he's on the move. What a beautiful day. Thanks for tuning in to Suzy Larson Live. We are having an amazing time together today in studio. Carolyn Haas joins me every month for Miracle Stories, where we dig into God's Word and pull out stories that are just leaping off the page at us of just God's provision, and then talking about modern day stories of how God intervenes in the affairs of men. Before the break, I set up the story, and I, I'll just give you a quick where we're at in the stories. I was pregnant on bed rest. I was unknowingly a uh, bit by the deer tick, but I started to get sick with neural symptoms during the pregnancy, delivered Jordan. And I, and because our middle son had a respiratory illness 10 months prior, I had to keep these two separate and I'm going back and forth trying to keep them separate all the while, not sleeping at all. Symptoms are going crazy. Uh, I was so exhausted by the morning that we went, I went to Jordan's room and his little lips were blue from coughing and I brought him to the hospital and we get into the hospital room, and he was two doors down from where Luke had stayed uh, 10, 11 months earlier. Kev went to call people. I'm sitting at his little crib, and he's in this tent. He's got a splint with his IV. They got an oximeter on him and all the different things. 
and I was so tired. And I knew that there were all these neuro symptoms, like I still got to face that, whatever that is, but I got to do this right now. And all of a sudden, joy and peace just overwhelmed me. Like, it was supernatural. It was the peace that passes understanding. I wasn't conjuring it up. I wasn't even fixating my eyes on God. I was exhausted. My face was numb, and I'm looking at my little baby. God flooded my whole being with peace. And I wrote in my journal, I don't know what this is, but I'll take it. He was in for a week. We got him out. My health plummeted. I got very, very sick. And they ruled out over the months MS and brain tumor. And a year later, found out it was Lyme disease. So that one day, my one day up, I was unknowingly bit by the deer tick. So here I'm a year in, and I gotten so sick, I could barely feed myself. My hubby scooped me up, brought me to the ER and like a rag doll, put me on the bed, and I was sick. And so they put a shunt in my arm and said, we're going to send you home, send a home health care nurse to your house to fill your fridge with IV bags. So we went home and I'm sitting there and the nurse filled our fridge with IV bags. She's teaching me how to clean it and how to, you know, and Kev, how to set up the IV. Jojo is a year old at this time. He's in his, just his diaper, mother of the year here. He's not even dressed, just diaper. He runs into the living room, spins around real fast and runs back out like Speedy Gonzalez. And the nurse says, what is he doing alive? And I'm like, what? And she said, well, it passes through the placenta 100% of the time. And... I have two other patients that were bit around the same time as you, unknowingly, just like you, had symptoms during their pregnancy. When those babies were born, they eventually went blind and died over the course of a few months. Why is he alive? Was he sick? And I said, yeah, actually. And she said, well, what? And I said, double pneumonia. I said, he's in the hospital. Well, did he get IV? And I said, yeah. What did they give him? I told her. And she said, that saved his life. I'm like, what? She goes, before you knew you had Lyme, They were treating him for Lyme. So in that moment, when I had all that peace, it was because I I was shocked that when we felt the presence of God, when our life group came over, I knew we were on the cusp of a miracle. And it goes back to that. But I thought, because the next morning his lips were blue. And I'm like, but I thought, I thought I felt your presence. Well, I did. But I thought you're going to answer my prayer. Well, he was, but his ways are higher. His thoughts are deeper. And I, I can't believe that God did that with no help from me. I was exhausted and he intervened in Jordan's story. Jordan is now a husband and a father and a son um, and loves Jesus. And I, I marvel that God would do that for us and for him. Sometimes he just does that, you know, but it's a story now that we get to tell. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Susie. I'm so inspired and I'm so encouraged and even just, the sense I even have for Jordan is that this is actually about his children Mm. and the legacy that his children are going to have. You know, it's like, oh, I'm just so excited for Mm. what God's doing in your family. Um, You know, when you were talking about the overlapping crisis and you, you said something really profound, Susie, you said that there was a, that the enemy had brought a visual um, for you, your worst case scenario, your fear. And, um, and you said something about what we see. And I thought it was so significant because if you go back to the, the passage that you read with us today, 2 Kings 6, I actually think it's profound that the servant was afraid. Mm-hmm. And what do we do? He's having that terrified. And, and the, in the NLT, it actually says the young man cried mm. out. Mm. And I have it underlined already. It was like, oh, he was young. And I love that Elisha said, no, don't be afraid. There are more on our, on our side than theirs. Oh, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. I think it's really profound because I think we need, we need older seasoned mentors in our lives who know and walk with the presence of God. Mm-hmm. And then it's okay for, for young to have, you know, to, their instant default is terrify fear, but you got to be connected with someone of faith. Do you know what I mean? You can't mm-hmm. just be in a circle of fear. Do you know what I mean? You've mm-hmm. got to have someone of faith that can, and then to say, Lord, open his eyes. And I think that's what the Lord would say to us today is, Lord, whose eyes listen, you know, whose ears need to be op- hear, open to hear, whose eyes need to be open to actually see what God is doing. Mm-hmm. Because later in that chapter, you were talking about the king and his terrible response. He actually said, uh, verse 33 um, of chapter six, all this misery is from the Lord. Yeah. Why should I? He didn't know who God was. That's right. You know what I mean? So yeah. he's interpreting this sickness, this diagnosis, this misery is from God. And I think that's so many people that we hear today mm-hmm. is God is a present. No, 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 no. God is ever present to help, to heal. He's mm-hmm. willing to heal. Like that's his perspective. Yeah. But we don't know what that looks like. Yeah. I think uh, one of the stories that we have. Um, we got about a minute. Actually, got about 40 seconds. 
40 seconds. Sorry. Okay. No, I just, I'll just say this. If we don't expect to see miracles, our odds of seeing them will decrease. Mm -hmm. And I just want to challenge everyone listening today. God wants to do a huge miracle right in front of you. But we think seeing is believing, but ironically, believing is Come on, seen. come on. And so then we maybe dare to pray, Lord, um, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, open my eyes that I may see. And, uh, and going back to Psalm 145, that we will speak of the glory of your kingdom. We will give examples of your power. That is a charge to us. I, I take that to heart. I want to give examples of power. And I, I am counting on this, Carolyn, that each month that we get together, we're not going to run out of stories. We've yeah. got some good ones in our, our past, but I need some new ones. Yes. And I'm counting on that. Yes. But scripture says that we're actually called to give examples of his power. So let's be in this together, friends. And I want to hear your examples of his power because he's a miracle working God. Carolyn, you are one of the busiest people I know and you took time for us. It just means the world to me. I'm praying God replenishes your time, but thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Susie. Love and appreciate you. Appreciate you as well. Thank you, thank you for tuning in today. I pray your faith is ignited. And if it is, be a radio missionary and share this show with as many friends as you can because who doesn't need their fire lit and ignited, right? Love you so much. We'll meet you back here next time. Thank you for listening to this conversation from Susie Larson Live. These conversations are available because of your support. You can become a supporter now at MyFaithRadio.com. Please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any episodes and then share it with friends so together we can all have a deeper life in Christ.